way, but she has some choice and some influence over which sperm get used. And guess what? The male can do nothing about that. So whose sperm wins out in the end? There's only one way to find out. We actually do paternity testing just like humans do in a court of law. And we use the same technique. And it's very precise. Roger was part of a team that extracted DNA samples from all the participants, the mother, her partners, and the babies, to find out who's the daddy. One of the biggest surprises is that the cross-dressing males got the very next fertilization. And we did not expect this at all. The only reason we can think of is that this is a very bold, smart tactic. And the females may be acknowledging that in sort of evolutionary terms. So this trick, as strange as it seems, is very successful. Over the course of a couple of weeks, each female will lay hundreds of eggs, sired by many fathers, filling up the crevices on the undersides of rocks. The eggs will remain there for three to five months until the babies are ready to hatch. But the newborns will be orphans. The mating season marks the end of the giant cuttlefish's life cycle and the parents won't survive to see the birth of the next generation. It looks like cuttlefish only have one mating season. It can last for up to six or eight weeks, but it's only the one session and then they all die. So some burn bright and die young, some live slightly longer and die, but all of them don't live very long. So it's probably only 18 months to two years old is how long they live. With such a short lifespan, it's even more surprising how smart these creatures seem to be. Intelligence is all about learning to adapt to new situations. Here at Millersville University in Pennsylvania, Gene Bowl wants to figure out just how much and how fast cuttlefish can learn. I think cuttlefish are remarkably intelligent animals. So the issue is, am I smart enough to find out how smart they are? For nearly 20 years, Gene has been running tests with cuttlefish and their more famous cousin, the octopus. I began with octopuses because there are no cuttlefish in the Americas. So like most Americans, I'd never heard of them. Octopuses love to destroy lab equipment. If they can possibly rip something apart, they will. <laughs> and in terms of their performance in experiments, octopuses are unbelievably erratic. One day they'll be brilliant, and the next five days they'll act like they don't know anything at all. Hey, everybody. How are you today? Huh? Once I got started working with cuttlefish, they're very practical animals to work with. They're very easy, and they're very engaging. And then on top of that, it looks like their brain size relative to body size is perhaps even larger than octopuses. And it would be really wonderful if we could just figure out what they're doing with all that brain. To test her cuttlefish, Jean has created a special enclosure fashioned from a plastic trash barrel, which the animals must try to escape from. The real difficulty for me is to find out how to ask them so that they can tell me what they know. They're certainly not going to tell me verbally. So I have to design a clever enough experiment that their behavior can tell me what they know. And that's what's really challenging and really, in many ways, exciting. She's up next. All right. Come on, sweetie. Come on. 13 research subjects with names like Bubbles, Goofy, and Crook are tested three times a day over several months. Right. Who have we got? We got Crook. OK. What time is it? Their job is to negotiate a simple maze and to find their way out as quickly as possible. The cuttlefish maze has a starting tube where they go in and just calm down for a few seconds. In she goes, she's in. Three, two, one. 
Doors open. And then there's a larger arena, and they have to decide whether to go to right or left. And there are features in there to help them distinguish that. In each trial, only one of the two exit doors is open. The cuttlefish has to look for clues to pick the right one. If there's a piece of plastic seaweed in the enclosure, then the stripe door will lead to freedom. But if the cuttlefish enters the maze and sees a big brick instead, then the solid door is the way to go. If the cuttlefish picks the wrong door, she'll be blocked by clear plastic. All right, this is Ted. So can a cuttlefish learn these rules? And in you go. The current problem that I'm working on is conditional discrimination learning. Can you remember the two things at once? One. Open. She's in. And we have good evidence that the cuttlefish can do this, which is truly extraordinary for an invertebrate animal. There she goes. She is out. Great time. The cuttlefish are able to recognize and remember at least two rules or conditions for finding the open exit. That's a level of intelligence much more common among creatures that possess a backbone. So what's really exciting about cuttlefish intelligence is we know that their relatives are clams and snails. Those are not animals that have a need for great intelligence. So whatever happened to cuttlefish was different. I think one of the reasons they have to be so smart is they've given up their external body armor like a snail has. They're soft, they're vulnerable, they can be eaten. Everything in the ocean eats a cuttlefish. So these animals have to get by, by their wits, so to speak. They have to be smart. Now, I think it's safe to say that cuttlefish are definitely as smart as fish. And in fact, they're as smart as maybe even some animals like birds and mammals and other things we consider to be smarter animals. The cuttlefish's big brain, together with its amazing camouflage, probably evolved so they could survive in dangerous environments filled with hungry fishes. But one cuttlefish might have acquired another secret weapon. Back in the tropics, Mark Norman and Ronald Sorante are searching for Mark's favorite cuttlefish who's managed to thrive in a unique and threatening landscape. These muck dives on sand and mud areas are very different. They feel very solemn and dark and moody. You have these black planes going everywhere. The few animals you do pass are either covered in poisonous spines or pretending to be dead leaves. You get this feeling that it's just oppressed by predators. This is a place of the weird and the wonderful, where standing out or blending in all depends on whether you are a predator or prey. It's one of the few places you'll find the rare mimic octopus. But the strangest of them all is a creature called the flamboyant cuttlefish. For a start, it's walking, not swimming. It's still really foreign for me to watch a cuttlefish walking around on the seafloor. They'd actually look like these prehistoric lumbering monsters sort of walking through these ancient black deserts. This enigmatic animal has made a huge impression on Mark despite the fact it's only a couple of inches long. Although the flamboyant cuttlefish walks most of the time, it can swim. 
but just barely. What's wrong? Cuttlefish get their name from their cuttle bone, a chalky internal shell filled with gas that allows them to float. But the tiny flamboyance cuttle bone has shrunk so much it can't float for very long. They seem to have a really gentle nature. They flap up into the water, they settle down again, and they go back to walking along the seafloor, back into camouflage, back into feeding almost straight away, looking for something to eat out on the mud. Like its big brothers, this cuttlefish has to grow fast and is often on the hunt. But to catch a tiny glass shrimp takes very good eyesight and patience. Stalking its meal in spiky disguise, it aims its feeding tentacles like a pool player ready to hit the target. Every creature, there's a hunter lurking. These open plains don't offer much cover, and to be out and about in broad daylight is risky, especially if you're neither fast nor big. Predators are a constant threat, and this is when the flamboyant cuttlefish earns its name. When 